I'll fight for you for the next eight years. There's nobody that's done more for Iowa than Donald Trump when I was president. This is go time. The final stretch, the very first votes of the 2024 elections. I've talked with some people who are really torn about who to support in the caucus because they say, who should I give momentum to? All eyes on Iowa caucus eve. Heating up, though bundled up and buried under. The frostbite uh, can come on within 20 minutes of exposed skin. So a little bit dangerous weather out there for the caucus tomorrow. The weather, the turnout, the tally, the Florida men. She's got this problem with ballistic podiatry, uh, shooting herself in the foot every other day. You're Our so own people desperate. first. We You're have just to put so Governor, desperate. Governor Haley. Momentum, last stand, can one of them move the numbers toward November? <laughs> This week in South Florida is on the road, a snow-covered campaign trail live from Des Moines, Iowa. And good morning, South Florida from inside a snow globe of a city. Des Moines is right now, last check, negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually a little bit warmer than it was when we woke up this morning. So we are headed into history in the making. The Iowa caucuses now just a day and a half away. The official start to the 2024 presidential campaign season and so critical for all the candidates. And they are this morning digesting a new poll, which we will talk about. This state, this vote could not be more different than what we know in Florida and what this state is doing right now and for Florida, all so critical. And we begin with a preview. All but empty streets. I went to choir practice last night. Dangerous roads. Minus double digits and burning windswept freeze. When there's a blizzard out, a lot of people and it's below zero, so it keeps people from coming out. Will it keep Iowans from the first in the nation caucus of the presidential election they are so collectively proud to have? I've always thought it was crazy that little old Iowa gets, you know, is the start. In the history of the Iowa caucus, no one has ever mentioned the weather changing the outcome until now. I know we're the campaign that's built to turn out our people in Florida's yeah. yeah. Florida's yeah. governor yeah. candidate yeah. pushed on with face-to-face -face -face meet and greets. You deserve an America without chaos. Nikki Haley yeah. and okay. former President Trump took much of their event going virtual. There's nobody that's done more for Iowa than Donald Trump when I was president. With two days left to rack up support, the final Des Moines Register poll late Saturday night shows Trump with 48% support, Haley moving into second place with 20, DeSantis with 16, and Vivek Ramaswamy with eight. Hello, Iowa. This is a great place. You're gonna have a big year. Happy New Year, by the way. Maybe more significant with the freeze factor, the poll shows Trump has the most enthusiastic supporters and the most committed. Caucus locations can be schools like this, churches, they can even be people's living rooms, and people just don't go to vote, they go to actually caucus to debate issues and talk about the candidates and try to persuade the other people to come to their side. Are you persuadable? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Countless will head to caucus still on the fence and even change party registration right there on the way in. Iowa's largest cities have swelled with incoming surrogates to speak at caucus locations. The swag of campaign season, an estimated $100 million boost to Iowa's economy. So these next 30 hours are going to be somewhat of a whirlwind, and we wanted to talk about that with a couple of people who are going to be right there on the front lines. Not only political reporters, but Florida political reporters for a great little roundtable here. Kimberly Leonard with Politico Florida and Forrest Saunders, who is the Scripps reporter at the Florida Capitol. And you both um, are so entrenched here this week. We couldn't get in until yesterday, and that's an ordeal you can find it on social media. But anyway, you've been here, you had the foresight, you've been on the ground, and I'm really anxious to talk to you a little bit about what you've been finding, but I wanna start with the poll. Because the poll numbers that came out last night um, put the governor that we all cover in third place, despite his laser focus on this state in the past couple of months with his ground game and visits and campaign. Kimberly, what happened? 
whatever he's selling isn't quite, you know, getting across to voters, I think. And what we're seeing is that the Trump enthusiasm is real. And he's benefiting from this idea of, you know, not just people already knowing him really well, but being like an incumbent, getting that rally around effect that came as a result of the indictments. And so he's just crushing the field. Now, the good news for Governor DeSantis in the poll is actually that it shows that his voters tend to be more enthusiastic about his candidacy than Nikki Haley's voters do. And so they're actually pretty close in numbers to where that ground game that they've been putting into effect, you know, the people who are going to show up for him, hopefully will help to edge that out. Because really, I think at this point, the people who support the governor, who work on his team, a strong second is okay for them. <laughs> they yeah. don't have to win. That's right. kind of how they're looking at this. And so if they can translate that enthusiasm into actually getting people out, they might be able to do well. Plenty of people will say, no, third is not good. And, well, enthusiasm, and we'll talk about that a lot during this hour, um, but that is going to be a factor. But to your point, margin of error, Nikki Haley, Governor DeSantis, within the margin of error, Forrest, um, what was really interesting is the run-up to this election was the governor's platform in Florida yeah. sailing through uh, the conservative culture warrior persona yeah. that he has adopted. He is deploying in full force here in 99 counties. Yep. Um, why wouldn't conservative Iowa voters flock to him rather than to a former president who, who may have a platform of conservative values, but who's been divorced several times, has had payoffs to porn stars through the courts. And, you know, what is in the mind of an Iowa evangelical voter? So I am an Iowan. I was born and raised in northwest Iowa. Uh, First-hand knowledge. Yeah, and I can tell you that Iowans typically want to focus on Iowa. And I think that's one of the big disconnects for a lot of the Iowa voters is they may not be paying as much attention to what's going on in the Sunshine State. I mean, they're worried about the Hawkeye State. They're worried about inflation here. They're worried about uh, prices of corn. They're worried about subsidies. They're worried about the farm bill. And so some of those issues really resonate with them. And they, they can look at the former president and say, okay, he was engaged. He was here in Iowa in 2016. He's been working hard with Iowa, and, uh, Iowa throughout his tenure uh, in the first term. Uh, and so they, they're more familiar with him. And I think that's something that I've heard from a lot of the Iowans that I've talked to since I came here, is that they know that they know the Trump administration. They know what they're getting when they support him. With DeSantis, uh, they think one of two things. They think either, well, you know, he's young, he's interesting, uh, but I know Trump. Or two, and this is another thing I hear a lot, he has plenty of time. He can wait his turn. We want to see Trump again. We know he can win. He did it in 2016. So maybe we back him again. And then if DeSantis comes along later on in 2028, maybe we'll support him then. So do you think that's in his head at all, that this is, you know, this may be, I'm working very hard, but this may be just a piece of the puzzle for a future goal? Because sometimes, I don't think the governor thinks like that. In, no, I, I, I him. would say he's yeah. all in for 2024. Yeah. I don't think he would have committed all this money, spent all this money, yeah. uh, and not want to actually get the nomination. I, I, you know, a lot of people were saying that about Francis Suarez, that he was just getting in to get his name out there and then maybe run again in 2028. This is a totally different operation. I mean, they've invested a ton in Iowa and some of the other early states. So if they don't get it here, I mean, it's going to be a big blow probably to his political uh, clout, uh, certainly back in Tallahassee. Uh, and, and then maybe going on to the future, who knows if he'll even be able to run in 2028. There may be another name. You, you know, we, um, we've been watching him make these what they call here retail stops. And, you know, the governor's gotten a lot of press about his very reserved personality and, you know, his kind of detachment from people. And I think, you know, just watching him do these retail handshaking, you know, he seems to be pretty comfortable now doing that. And he's done it a lot. He's been out in sub-zero weather doing it, but I guess it, it, the polls show that if you believe the polls, it didn't really resonate the way he thought. He has gotten really comfortable. And I wasn't on the trail early um, in, the, in the Iowa caucus coming up time, but, um, he had a little swagger, he's making jokes, you know, you can tell he's having fun. So the awkward persona that was described by a lot of national outlets earlier on in the race, I don't see that person now. Here's the thing though, when it comes to Trump, he has, he has given a lot of arguments about why people should vote for him ex besides Trump. And they all make a lot of sense, you know, he followed through on more of his promises, he's more conservative, he'll get the job done. 
people's attachment to Trump is not logical. It's emotional. It's visceral. It's he's our guy. I mean, I had one person tell me it's it's not about policy. It's a gut feeling. Yeah. Literally, those were his words. And so they haven't been able to cut through that. I could see an alternate universe where Trump isn't running and DeSantis is the front runner. That's what's so interesting because so many people told me, like you said, oh yeah, in 2028, as though, oh yes, that'll just happen, you know, <laughs> and this will be the guy. So there is a lot of interest and people, when they go to him, you know, they go to his events, they like what they hear, but you know, Trump is just this force and it's so hard to get past it. It was never going to be easy, but I don't think they expected how it would be a lot harder to just kind of figure out how to crack that. And no one really has, right? Yeah. I mean, Joe Biden did, but, you know, no, a lot of people, a lot of Republicans have lost to Donald Trump. So. You know, um, I want to bring up a little bit of behind the scenes action here because President Trump ha went virtual along with Nikki Haley because of the weather. And you can't really blame them for doing that. The, the governor didn't. He was out yep. there. Yeah. Um, but the uh, former president did keep uh, one event later today in Indianola, which we all applied for credentials for. I've never been denied credentials to any event for any candidate. I'm going to guess you haven't either, except this one, along with all our hometown newspapers, along with the, the New York Times. No one was credentialed for this but for Iowa Press. What does that say? Well, I think that it says, you know, that they are maybe a little concerned about some of the numbers. I mean, yes, he had a huge margin in this latest Iowa poll, but he was under 50%. So he slipped a little bit since the last poll that we saw. Uh, and maybe he just wants to go all in on Iowa as hard as he can, get as much Iowa press out there as possible and just flood the zone. So we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, when we come back during this hour, we have a little something something called Caucus 101 for anyone who does not really know what a caucus means, but we are back with more conversation right after the break. We are back from Des Moines, Iowa, heading into the caucuses, a little reporter roundtable with Florida-based political reporters. Kimberly Leonard with Politico, Forrest Saunders with Scripps at the Florida Capitol. Forrest, you, you've been here, you've been on the ground, everyone's talking about the weather. You can't tell how cold it is by this beautiful shot, but it is um, brutal and dangerous in many ways. What are you hearing from caucus goers? Will this affect the numbers? I think it has to, because uh, honestly, I don't want to go out and deal with that. And, Ditto. And I get paid for it, right? <laughs> Ditto. So, and the caucus is a, is a more cumbersome process than a primary, right? You have to go there. Uh, you have to be there for, you know, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. There are rounds of votes, different kinds of votes for different things. Um, you know, Republicans do it a lot simpler than Democrats do. But for the large part, you have to commit. You really have to commit to caucus just because it's a process. And so some people, it's, it starts at 7 p.m. in here in Iowa. It's, it's something that they may not have time for, or they may be busy with other things, or they, they may be watching football. They may not want to get up and go. And so I think a lot of the campaigns recognize that. They recognize that the weather is going to have a chilling effect, quite literally. And they're doing everything they can to try and encourage people to come out. Uh, you've heard the closing arguments from the DeSantis campaign. They have hammered people. Please come out. Please bring your friends. We believe the ground game will help us. Uh, get over the hill here. I, and I think I heard from one of his campaign people that they're actually offering rides. It's yes. like Florida, rides to the polls. Although legitimately there may be car trouble, there may be blocked roads. People who might want to caucus might not be able to physically go and that's the only way to do yeah, it. I haven't been able to cover as many DeSantis events as I had initially planned because yeah. the roads are not safe. There are warning signs. If you go to the Stone website, it says do not drive here. Yeah. It's going to be really hard for older adults. And as so, a reporter, you didn't ignore the sign and just uh, go. <laughs> I usually do. You know, it still gets me. But, you know, it's not safe for a lot of people. And even yeah. driving here, there were cars all over on the side of the road. Yeah. Oh, right, so, right. I'm glad you're here. I you know, I know. It's scary. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there can be a lot of slip and sliding. And yeah. um, so, you know, safety, of course, is a concern. They don't want a big. And I worry about the campaigns, too, as they're out on the road today making their final right. case. You know, the, pe the volunteers, the people who are knocking on doors. Um, it's dangerous. Yeah. It's nothing to, you know, feel lightly about or 
be too cavalier about, yeah. for sure. You know, um, in the short time we have together, we talk a lot about, we talked about the conservative vote here. Mm -hmm. You know, Florida is a conservative state, although there are a lot of people who would dispute that now, but, you know, it is at the moment. And, um, and Florida also has a huge share, I think almost a third, of no party affiliated voters and PAs. How, how does Iowa fare with independence, especially because in a caucus, anyone can go Monday night, 7 o'clock, and become a Republican or a Democrat in that primary to vote? And, and what do you think the effect of the independent vote may be in the caucus? Um, well, I can tell you this. I was talking to Bob Vanderplotz just the other day. He's an evangelical uh, leader in the state. He's also a political activist, uh, been deeply ingrained in the Republican Party for years. And he, he truly believes that this is just a big Republican gathering, and it's going to be a huge Republican gathering. He thinks that uh, uh, one of the reasons that uh, he's not really counting the independents in this, in this caucus because he, he thinks that this is just something between Republicans. They've got to figure out their path forward. He thinks it's going to be a defining moment in this election cycle. He thinks if Trump, you know, steamrolls this thing, that it's it's going to be over before it even begins. And he thinks that Iowa is really going to matter more, maybe than any other uh, presidential cycle that we've had in recent memory, because of that, because there is this big civil war happening within the party right now. Which makes an independent vote even more valuable, Kimberly. Yeah, I actually talked to one voter who was, was liberal and is going to re-register just for a day and then go back, who wants to defeat Trump at all costs and is going in for Nikki Haley because he sees more of a path. Okay, is this, a, is this someone who's going to vote for a Republican who they would like to be, see as president if, just, if that's the case, or to, or to ruin the pot? Just stop Trump. <laughs> that's kind of the big goal, so you know, to be able to stop his momentum. And I think for I think one of the reasons that Nikki Haley is also doing better in the polls as well is because there is a clear shot for her in New Hampshire. And so when she has that momentum, for a lot of the voters who here don't like Trump, they just see it a cleaner, you know, one on one contest between her and Trump. And it's all driven by the polls. So that's what's been hard, I think, for a lot of the people on the DeSantis campaign is no. that the narrative is driven by this, these poll numbers. Yeah, and the DeSantis campaign and DeSantis himself will be the first to say, you know, the media says, the media narrative is, to his point. Kimberly Leonard, Farah Saunders, so great to have you here live because we've all had such issues being places <laughs> live. So really appreciate your time. This was a lot of fun and, and have a, a great professional time in the next 30 hours. Thanks. You too. <laughs> all right. And we will have more from Des Moines, Iowa in this hour. But first, we're going to kick it back to the Local 10 studios. Janine Stanwood, Stanwood is standing by there with some people who are watching from there very closely. Absolutely. And by the way, Glenna, we will never complain about a cold studio again after seeing some of those shots that you again. were uh, dealing never. with. Absolutely. Glenna, thank you. We are here with representation from both political parties, Democratic Chair Robert Dempster from Miami-Dade and Republican State Committeeman Richard DiNapoli from Broward. We will have their thoughts on what the Iowa caucuses mean to us right here in South Florida coming up later on this broadcast. But for now, we're going to take a quick break Then we're back with Glenna live in Des Moines. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Des Moines, Iowa on this caucus eve. The nation's election focus is right here on this very small state. This state has a fraction of Florida's population, a fraction of its diversity, yet this is where all the candidates have been so focused, especially Governor DeSantis's candidate for so many months. So that brings up the question, do the caucuses even matter? They are so different from the way Florida votes back home. So to answer those questions, we went to a couple of experts. They are political science reporters from the University of Iowa and from Iowa State University. Iowans are hardy folk, but we are talking about, you know, sub-zero temperatures and uh, country roads that may not be fully clear. Hardy um, and only go so far. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but also, I think it's important to remember that the, uh, the demographics of the Republican Party tend to be more rural and older. Um, older voters. And so they might um, not have access to the good roadways, so they might literally be snowed in. I mean, one of the things that can happen 
to cars and trucks um, in such bitterly cold weather is that the engine block will freeze and the battery will get too cold to turn over. So there is a risk to actually go and have to participate in a meeting for a couple of hours if the temperatures are very bitterly cold and there is a significant wind chill. People in Florida look at Iowa as a very small state, as well as very cold state, and also a state with a, a fraction of the voters that bigger states like Florida have, not altogether the diversity of states like ours. Why does Iowa caucuses matter? Well, the main reason that the Iowa caucuses matter is because we're the first in the process and we do a pretty good job of what we're assigned in the sense of looking at the candidates. And basically what we say here is that we're not the kingmaker, but we separate the contenders from the pretenders. And so a lot of candidates that will come in that say they're running for president, sometimes they are, sometimes they're maybe looking down the road for a vice presidential slot or a cabinet slot or something like that. But we basically, being Iowa voters, basically take a hard look at these candidates and give them a chance. So somebody can come in with not a lot of name recognition, very low resources, and still go out and talk to Iowa voters, make their case. And if they catch on, then potentially their campaign can grow and they can maybe even go as far as winning the Iowa caucuses. We see enthusiasm for a candidate is such a deciding factor. And I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying this country has never seen an enthusiasm factor like that of former President Trump in 2016 and again this time. So might that enthusiasm factor really play a large role in those who are enthusiastic enough to overcome what they need to overcome to get to a caucus location? So all of the candidates, you know, I would say the three front runners, um, DeSantis, Haley, and Trump are not only running against each other in the race for convention delegates, but they are also running a, a race against this nebulous contest of expected, right? So if Trump comes in first, but doesn't have the 20 point lead as expected, he could actually lose by winning. Um, and similarly, if uh, Haley and DeSantis do better than expected, even if they don't come in first, could be deemed sort of winners, even if they are not, you know, the first place finishers. It's momentum, it's bragging rights. Um, to your point, the winner doesn't always go on to get the nomination. Is number, number one, the winner is the winner, but coming in second or third, in the caucus is kind of a win for some candidates too, and might be this time. We often talk about there being three tickets out of Iowa. And certainly if you win the Iowa caucuses, that's good, but it's always a matter of expectations too. So if you're expected to win, uh, as Trump seems to be for this cycle, but if he doesn't win by that huge margin that he's been polling, if all of a sudden DeSantis or Haley manages to cut that gap in half or, or more, then now all of a sudden that first place win doesn't look so shiny anymore. I wanted to talk a little bit about the very interesting and personal kind of retail politics that Iowa voters really demand to get their vote. I mean, this is not, President Trump does the big rallies with hundreds of thousands of people, but Iowans really want a face-to-face -face conversation. They want to know who they're voting for. And, and I think that's really unique to Iowa as they go into the caucus process, which is a place where they debate with each other. They're pretty engaged. They know their stuff. Yes, that's absolutely true. And one of the advantages of having Iowa continue to go first is because Iowans are used to this. They're used to the the idea that they need to talk to these candidates and find out where they stand on the issues. And it gives candidates an opportunity to understand what the issues are for folks that are outside either the DC bubble or maybe their state capital bubble, if it's a governor or something of that nature. And I've talked with some people who are really torn about who to support in the caucus because they say, who should I give momentum to? An on Iowa voter can register for a party moments before they go into that caucus room. Yes, so absolutely. Wonder, you know, on in, in a positive note, it's a very deliberative choice that they're making mm -hmm. in a more conspiratorial kind of thought. Maybe, you know, are people going to be, are Democrats going to be registering as Republicans 
to, to throw the race. How do I want to say? It's certainly not an organized effort on the part of the Iowa Democratic Party, but there might be some people who, who have at least shared with me privately that they are seriously thinking about doing that, in part because of their opposition to President Trump. The caucus process is baked into the process is voters go before they cast a vote, they actually talk about the issues and the candidates and debate with each other and consider right there in real time for whom they're going to vote. And we actually met a woman who, even at this stage, feels like she's going to make the decision Monday night. Talk a little bit about the actual process. She's she's going to go in. She's going to debate with her her fellow caucus room people, and and then what? Basically, then you have representatives of each campaign if they're there, and there are some nearly seventeen hundred precincts across the state. So it's a, a big part of the campaign building aspect to this that you can identify a, a volunteer a supporter in each of those precincts to speak on your candidate's behalf. And that person will give a short speech, usually about three minutes, and you go through all of the candidates that are doing. And then they basically just vote and they have little slips of paper. Sometimes it's actually a printed ballot if there are lots of candidates. And then tally them up, report them in. Um, and we're excited about having gone to all 99 counties. Having Thinking about what comes next, because once you go from Iowa and the somewhat conservative and, and somewhat faith-based vote, everyone heads to New Hampshire for the don't tread on me libertarian vote. Yep. And and what a contrast that's going to be. And I'm thinking about, you know, Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, who has been so focused on Iowa, both in content and in organization. Um, yes, how, absolutely. Someone like that, how does his game, do you expect, go to New Hampshire now? Although he's, I hear, headed to South Carolina after Iowa. <laughs> But what does that mean? Yes, but like I, I think that that's a wise move on DeSantis's part because he has really framed his um, campaign first on being I'm just like Trump, but without the baggage and then into the culture warrior. Uh, and so with the culture wars, that's definitely going to resonate with an evangelical electorate, uh, which, as you correctly note, is uh, less of a factor in uh, in New Hampshire than it is in Iowa. And it is certainly less of a factor than it is in South Carolina. Uh, but that um, that should not be taken for granted. I mean, in South Carolina currently, um, Trump is running ahead in the polls, but you have to remember that Nikki Haley was a very popular governor and a two-term governor in South Carolina. And so, you know, she's well known. Our thanks to the professors who would have been here, but for the weather. So this is what negative 11 degrees looks like. I know you're thinking it sure is pretty. What does it feel like? That's a whole other story for another time. Right now, we're taking this week in South Florida back to South Florida. Coming up next, Janine Stanwood takes it from here. Welcome back to This Week in South Florida with Glenna Milberg. I'm Janine Stanwood right here in South Florida. Glenna, as you've seen, is live on the road right now in downtown Des Moines, Iowa, where the weather is dominating the headlines just as much as the presidential candidates. We're gonna check back with Glenna in just a few minutes as promised, but we're back here in studio today to bring it all home. Joining us this morning, a Democrat and a Republican from Miami-Dade and Broward counties respectively to tell us a little more about what the Iowa caucuses mean to us here. Robert Dempster is chair of the Democratic Party in Miami-Dade County, and Richard DiNapoli is the state committeeman for the Republican Party in Broward County. Thank you both for coming in and talking to us about uh, everything that's going on in Iowa. Robert, I want to start with you. Iowa couldn't be any more different than South Florida. Of course, the Republican caucuses are going on. So as a Democrat here in South Florida, why are you paying attention to this? Well. You know, South Florida Democrats are Americans and we all have like a really vested interest in who is going to be on the ballot in November to be, you know, president of the country. So I think that there's that. 
And in this election, it's pretty unique because there are two of the front runners are actually from Florida. So there, there's naturally a lot of attention on that. Um, Richard, that actually brings me to you then, because the poll that just came out last night, the Des Moines Register poll, which is very closely watched, now has Governor DeSantis at number three, just behind Nikki Haley. So depending on what happens on Monday, if he is in number three on Monday, what does that mean for the DeSantis campaign? It could be over for them if he's in number three on Monday. I would expect uh, anyone coming in three or below probably to drop out after the Iowa caucus because it's number two is what really this election is all about right now in Iowa. It's really Trump is expected to win by a large amount and it's just everybody trying to campaign to see who is the uh, Trump alternative and that's who's going to make it to New Hampshire and then see what happens then. But I'd expect a massive amount of candidates or whoever's left to start dropping out right after Iowa. Florida, of course, is in the spotlight because, as you know, the legislative session started this week. And on the state and national level, uh, abortion is something that everybody has been talking about. In fact, let's go to that because, as you know, David Barrero of Sweetwater filed this bill to basically make abortion just about illegal except to save the life of a pregnant woman in an emergency. Richard, is there an appetite for this right now? Well, among Republicans. Well, the Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo said that uh, she doesn't have an appetite and neither did Paul Renner. So it might make headlines right now, but we also have a Supreme, uh, Florida Supreme Court case coming up to decide whether the 15-week ban and then the six-week ban comes into effect. You have a constitutional amendment coming up. So it might be making some headlines for getting filed, but when the Senate President and the House Speaker does not uh, say that they're going to push it forward, it's probably going to die in committee. A lot of this is maybe sort of the culture war stuff that we've been hearing about. Is this galvanizing the Democrats? Uh, you know, the, the last year abortion has, has really been front and center. Um, is that something that is galvanizing um, some pro-choice people in opposition? Yeah, I would say that it's not necessarily, I mean, it is galvanizing Democrats, but it's more broadly, it's galvanizing Americans all over the country. If you look at even more conservative states, like Kansas, everywhere that it's been on the ballot thus far, you've seen results, you know, you've seen like overwhelming results in favor of giving a woman a right to choose. This is an incredibly unpopular bill, e even by Republican standards, no offense, but it's an incredibly unpopular bill. It's draconian beyond measure. And it's going to have like a really, it's going to have a number of different effects, but primarily, but one of the effects that you don't think about is that it's actually discouraging medical students from going into the OBGYN profession. You and know? of course And that are. hurts all women, not just women who are seeking abortions. Um, let's talk about guns right now, because as you know, last year lawmakers dropped a requirement to, uh, the, that people have concealed weapons permits to carry guns, right? So now there is a new bill that's advancing in the House that would let folks openly carry firearms. And not just that, but lawmakers could c carry concealed uh, firearms um, in areas like the Capitol complex. Um, is this something that could potentially foster intimidation? Uh, or is this a way to say, hey, listen, the law abiding people, um, th there have been too many restrictions on them. What do you think? Uh, I think that's, a, that, that's an excellent point that you make. And, uh, you know, that bill, if you, I, I read it, and that bill, you know, it lets you carry, it lets you open carry weapons, and it also lets you open carry rifles, and it also increases the number of areas that you're actually able to do that. You can, according to this bill, you would be able to go ahead and carry, carry an assault rifle, open carry an assault rifle at a school sporting event, at a polling place. And we've already had, you know, in the last election, we had, you know, multiple instances of intimidation at polling sites. So I, I don't, the thing that I find interesting is that government's supposed to go ahead and solve problems that we can't solve individually. I just don't see the problem that, you know, this was a solution for. But the thinking, of course, is that the criminals don't pay attention to the rules anyway, right, Richard? What do you think about this? That is true. The criminals usually aren't going to look for permits or look for uh, whatever the law says. They're just going to do a criminal activity. Do you and think reality, this is something that will sort of advance that Republicans could be behind? Well, Sen Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo has said that she doesn't have an appetite for open carry uh, for this legislative cycle. Uh, Governor DeSantis did say that he would sign it, but uh, the permitless concealed carry was signed last year. We have not seen any increase in crime since then. We have crime stats at a 50-year low here in Florida, and you'll hear from the other side typically that uh, any type of uh, reduction in uh, 
in uh, gun laws for, for carrying or whatever is going to lead to massive spurts in crime. And the reality is the stats just don't show that. Lots to talk about in Tallahassee. Guns, abortion, pink flamingos, balloons. We can't get to it all. We wish we could. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, we will be back in just a couple of minutes with Glenna Milberg live in Iowa. We'll be back. We are back with one of the biggest South Florida stories this week as former Miami-Dade School Board Vice Chair Luby Navarro is accused of stealing money from the school district she was supposed to represent. She spent nights behind bars. We're told she will be confined to home arrest for right now. Local 10's Hats Avella covers it all, including education yes. right here in South Florida, Broward and Miami-Dade County. He was at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Facility on Thursday when Navarro was brought in. Take a look. The allegations against Luby Navarro are jaw-dropping. Prosecutors say a betrayal of the public trust. Navarro made over $100,000 in unauthorized personal purchases during 2022. The state attorney says the suspicious activity was initially uncovered by school district staff. The purchases showed the former school board member was at times on a shopping spree. Including Walmart, Office Depot, TJ Maxx, Brands Mart. The list of stores is long and so are the expenses more than $92,000. Navarro's purchases were not school related. Prosecutors say there's evidence by way of store surveillance video and photographs which show they say Navarro was buying appliances, electronics, clothing and even 178 gift cards. Some of those items were found in her own home. Then there's the money she spent on travel. Prosecutors say more than nine grand on pricey trips for her, her mother, and boyfriend to places like Vegas and Dominican Republic. Luby Navarro. 49-year-old Navarro in court today, represented by a high-profile attorney. The judge said bond at $2 million. There was an extensive scheme to defraud that went on for several months. Here's exclusive video of Navarro as she was booked into jail at around 10.30 this morning. Navarro, a darling in local conservative circles, stepped down as a member of the Miami-Dade School Board in December of 2022 because of a state constitutional amendment that bans politicians from being lobbyists. Navarro is a registered lobbyist, the director of government affairs at the Memorial Healthcare System. She was first appointed to the school board in 2015 by then-Governor Rick Scott. So Local 10 first broke this story. Hatzel, you got the tip about the arrest when? Thursday morning is when we got it. But we've known, in fact, that there was an investigation underway for months. But, of course, investigators were was very tight-lipped in terms of uh, divulging any sort of information when it came to the investigation. And finally, Thursday is when we got the tip. We confirmed it right away, and we went with the story. I mean, it, it has been jaw-dropping. I mean, just astonishing. I to, was going to, to, to ask to, you, to, wow, that arrest wow. warrant is... 90 plus pages long. We both read it. Yes. You've been covering education for a long time. Have you ever seen anything like that? Never seen anything like that. The detail that goes into uh, this case in terms of what she was spending, how often she was spending the money, it's just incredible that these prosecutors went to great length to really tell you the story of what was happening here. So here's the question though, because according to the A form, those cards, the P card, there are pretty strict rules, right? Yep. So anything over $999, for example, you have to get three quotes, you've got to get that back. So the fact that the allegations were that she was spending so much money and nobody noticed and for that's that time? going to going moving forward that's going to be the big question what happens when it comes to the school district when it comes to what they do what they change to make sure that this doesn't happen again in fact the inspector general talked about this and the fact that they're going to be pro provide some recommendations if you will for the school district in terms of what should happen going forward any indication of what the defense will be her attorney says listen if you had to explain this in 92 <laughs> uh, pages there's more to it what? That's the big question, right? That's what we wanted to ask Ben Cuny, his her attorney. How in the world do you defend do you defend this given so much information that was laid out in the warrant in terms of uh, what happened here? I, I don't know how he defends it, but that's part of the story, right? How do we move forward and what does he do to defend her? We will stay tuned. Hassel, yes, thank you so much course. for your reporting as always. Okay. Love it.
Yeah. We want to throw it back to Glenna in a frigid Des Moines, Iowa, where the weather is affecting everybody this holiday weekend ahead of tomorrow's caucuses. Glenna, how are you doing? Um, not frigid inside, so that's the good news for the moment. But let's bring in Brandon Orr because the Iowa caucuses are the focus of the nation. There are the candidates and the ground game and the issues and super engaged voters. But the story and everything hinges on the weather. Brandon Orr, how is this going to go down? And I think there are two different things that could affect voter turnout tomorrow, and that's one going to be the cold. We have temperatures tomorrow at 7 o'clock central time as everything's going on, 9 degrees below zero. But when you factor in the wind chill, which is kind of the opposite of what we always look at, the heat index, the wind chill is when that wind blows away your body heat, makes it feel a lot colder, it pulls that heat away from your skin. Uh, frostbite can come on even faster at wind chill 32 degrees below zero when it comes down to uh, actual time tomorrow at seven o'clock in the evening. That means frostbite can come on in 20 minutes. In fact, this river, we've been watching it on our live cameras ever since we came on the air at 5 a.m. and have been watching the ice patches grow. We've literally seen the river freeze before our eyes. Second thing, Glenna, is the snow. We've been seeing the plows come through across some of the bridges here, piling up the snow about halfway up the cars on this bridge. It's not fun to dig out. Some people may have to dig their way out of their cars to go out and about tomorrow. The northern part of Iowa, not too bad, about a half a foot of snow, not too bad. But if you look at Des Moines over to Iowa City, I mean, there's a foot, foot and a half of snow that they have to dig out. So this is going to be a big problem for them tomorrow, Glenna. You know, you bring up something so important, the frostbite. I will tell you, Yesterday, being outside for literally seven minutes, our photographer Bob Palumbo got in the car looking oh, yeah. like he had been in the sun for two hours. It really frightened me. And you see now the candidates are kind of walking a line. They want turnout. Everyone get out, get out and caucus for me. But literally what they're telling people is something that might be really, literally very dangerous for them to do. It doesn't take long for exposed skin to start freezing when you get temperatures like this. But Glenn, I have a question for you, actually, because us here in down uh, South Florida, you know, it gets 50 degrees and we're kind of wimps. I'm talking about myself here. We start freezing. We start <laughs> shutting down. But those in Iowa, there's some people up there that are built a little bit differently from the locals you have talked to so far. How are they taking this cold? Is it as extreme as what it looks like to us from down here? It, well, the short answer to that is it is extreme. But to your point, we were actually in northern Iowa. We've been around the state. And the people who are lifelong Iowans who are prepared and know how to dress and are somewhat acclimated to it are, are some people who say, yeah, you know, we're used to it. Um, but that does not mitigate the fact that any human being who is in below zero temperatures can't not feel it and can't not be susceptible to that. So bravado, we've seen it all over the place. So um, I want to thank you because weather is always news in South Florida and yes. boy, is it here now. So Brandon, thanks so much for being with us and everybody from Des Moines, Iowa. We will be right back. A big local 10 shout out to photojournalist Bob Palumbo. There he is, Glenna's partner in Iowa, definitely cleaning the frozen windshield of their rental car on that treacherous journey to Des Moines. Bob is a rock star. Thank goodness he's from New England and he knows what he's doing. This is no doubt an appropriate way to wrap up this very 100%. special edition of This Week in South Florida with Glenna Milberg. Glenna in Iowa, getting ready for and my tomorrow's co -conspirator. caucuses. Your co-conspirator, he's a good we, we are. And a good driver, thank goodness. So this has been a lot of fun. Des Moines on the road, a lot more to come. Uh, just so you know, this week in South Florida on the road, we're doing it all again next week. We are taking it to New Hampshire, where there is the first in the nation primaries on the way to election 2024. Uh, so that's next week. Oh, but first is the Iowa caucuses Monday night. You know, Local 10 will have all the coverage right here. We are so happy you were with us this hour. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a beautiful Sunday. And remember, keep in touch.